Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the last uh, 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 talk by our uh, postdoc candidate today. We have uh, Yuan Yao from the University of Tokyo Institute for Policy Physics. Uh, and unfortunately, he could not come, but he's uh, connected via Skype. Um, so, uh, Yuan will talk about uh, symmetry protective classification in spin system by bulk construction. Uh, please, we have more or less 45 minutes, and then there will be uh, questions. Okay? Thank yeah. Please. Thanks very much for the introduction and giving me this opportunity to present our recent work uh, on symmetry classifications in strong correlated systems. Uh, first of all, I need to apologize for any inconvenience in the future when ours due to this video seminar. In this talk, uh, I want to talk about uh, several papers. Uh, uh, the first the first paper is uh, in collaboration with Masaki and the Changze at the University of Tokyo. Uh, and in this first part, I will use the technique uh, based on the second paper, which was partially done actually at IPHT two years ago. Uh, as future direction, uh, I want to uh, briefly introduce uh, some idea in the third papers uh, in last year. Uh, so to introduce uh, our new classification for the uh, spin systems, I want to review some uh, conventional uh, symmetry protective classifications for the gap system. So let's imagine that we have uh, a series of uh, gapped Hamiltonians, which were which are which are tuned by many parameters. So without any symmetries to be required, we can adiabatically transform any Hamiltonian to the trivial Hamiltonian, which is defined to be uh, to be the Hamiltonian that have uh, that has a, a atomic state as its unique ground state. So here, the adiabatic transformation means that during this process, uh, this tuning process, uh, the gap doesn't close. However, if we require some certain symmetry, uh, this process uh, doesn't exist. Then we say that uh, this phase, uh, this Hamiltonian belongs to a non-trivial phase, which is distinct from the trivial atomic phase. Uh, briefly speaking, uh, this SPT classification uh, is equivalent to the connectedness by this no gap closing adiabatic transformation on the phase diagram. Uh, however, uh, what about the uh, low energy theories without any gap? Uh, because this SPT classification heavily depends on the well-defined uh, bulk gap, so the situation will be uh, the situation will be bad if we don't have any gap. For instance, the critical phases. Um, so let's uh, let, let me first give the, uh, the definition of this uh, symmetry protected QFT classifications. Let's imagine that we have the, these two parts of QFTs. Uh, on the left side, there can be some uh, flow, which is driven by some interaction, local interaction addition. Uh, for instance, we can add some local interaction on the lattice to transform the QFT A1 to A3. But there is no interaction ad uh, addition can, can connect uh, one QFT on the left side and the other QFT on the right side. In this situation, we said that these uh, two flow configuration gives two distinct classes for this QFT classification. The formal classification uh, is that two QFTs belongs, belong to the same class if they are connected by some symmetric lattice interactions. Uh, so in this case, the classification is somehow equivalent to the connectedness by the symmetric interactions, the addition, I, I want to say. Uh, one way to, uh, to, to do this classification uh, is, by the, uh, is, uh, is, find, uh, is to find the uh, invariance along these flows, uh, which I will call universal invariance. Uh, so uh, this invariance can help us to classify or to detect uh, whether two CF, uh, whether two QFT are in the same class or not. 
the first uh, so uh, the first application of this classification uh, is for the critical phases. Uh, let's imagine that we have already classified, do the QFT classifies for these conformal field theories. Uh, and uh, because we know uh, the renormalization group flows are a special uh, interaction uh, addition, because uh, RG flow cannot, cannot uh, produce a non-local interaction. Yeah. So uh, there can only RG flow below, uh, uh, between the CFTs on the left side. Uh, however, there is no RG flow uh, between the CFTs in distinct classes. So this QFT classification can sp specifically give the connectedness of RG flows. Uh, it means that each lattice uh, once realize one CFT in this in some class, then it cannot uh, realize any one of the remaining classes. Uh, the second use for example uh, for this QFT classification is the following claim that uh, for a fixed Hilbert space uh, H defined on some lattice, all the low energy field series realized by this Hilbert space are always in the same class. It means that classification depends at the most on the Hilbert spaces. So it, uh, I, I will give a very brief proof uh, for this claim. Let's take uh, any two parent let local lattice Hamiltonians, for instance, H1 and H2. Uh, this H1 can realize some QFT1, and this H2 can realize some QFT2 at low energy limit. Because we know that H1 and H2 are the Hamiltonian defined on the same uh, Hilbert space, H, and the, both of them are local. So their difference must be local, must be local as well. Then the, this QFT1 and the QFT2, have, uh, they, have the, uh, they have the same Hamiltonian modulus and local operators. So by our definition, these QFTs must be equivalent, or they belong. They, these two QFTs belong to the same QFT classification class. So it means that we need to only uh, consider the Hilbert space rather than any details within one Hilbert space. So let's do the, this classification uh, for the uh, conventional SU2 spin models in 1D uh, by looking for some universal invariance or the bulk construction. Uh, the SUTSB models uh, are defined on, uh, on, the, on one dimensional chain. And at each unit cell, we have, uh, uh, we have a spin degrees of freedom. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, the, the few theories to be classified is all the QFTs of all spin chains, for instance, the uh, collections of QFTs of spin one half, one, three half, and two, and blah, blah. Uh, the required symmetries uh, in our interest is the spin rotation symmetry, SU2, and the lattice translation symmetry, uh, which is represented in, in a very conventional way. Uh, but uh, but one, one thing to be noted is that this spin rotation symmetry, although we denoted it as SU2, but it's actually some SO3 rotation symmetry because this uh, U and the U dagger can have a sign ambiguity, which there is nothing on this spin operator. Uh, so let's let's take a look at the simplest case, namely the spin one half. We have a spin one half per side uh, spin chain. Uh, the, every uh, spin one half can be equivalent to a half field two flavor fermion. Uh, we have a two flavor at each side, and when the first flavor is occupied, we will call this uh, state as spin up. And when, this, when the second uh, occupation, uh, when, the, when the second flavor is occupied, then we will be noted as spin down. Then we map the uh, spin one half to the half field two flavor fermion per site. In the operator language, we can denote the uh, 
we, we can use the creation operator of that fermion, two flavor fermion, uh, to uh, onto the vacuum to create two spin states. And indeed, the uh, spin operator can be also mapped to some uh, firm, firm, fermion bilinear operators. And the half field, op, half field condition, uh, it, it can be realized by this number of constraints on each side. Uh, but in the fermion language, there is a, a redundancy in this, uh, in this, uh, in AS Huber space. So when we do a position dependent U1 uh, global symmetry, then it does nothing on the spin operator. It means that this U1 global symmetry is actually not a symmetry, but a gauge symmetry. Uh, so let's, let's match the global symmetries on between the spin the spin language and the fermion language. The SU2 spin rotation is enlarged to some U2 symmetry, uh, which is uh, act on, on a natural way uh, to the fermion operator. And the translation is also naturally uh, acts on this creation operator. Uh, as we have discussed that the, there is a U1 gauge redundancy. So there is a U1 gauge symmetry for, uh, for this for, uh, in the fermion picture. Let, so actually there is no inconsistency in the global symmetry because uh, we have a global symmetry U2 and the gauge symmetry U1. So formally the global symmetry is U2 modded by this U1, which is exactly the SO3 or uh, a, a, SU2 spin rotation symmetry. So the global symmetry between these two pictures uh, perfectly matches. Uh, so uh, one typical low energy theory uh, is, uh, was obtained by Affleck in 1986 uh, for, uh, for the Heisenberg model, the low energy field theories uh, for this uh, spin one half is the two flavored Dirac fermions. Uh, in 1 plus 1D. And we know that uh, 1 plus 1D Dirac fermions uh, consists of two chirolities, psi L and psi R. And the good way to understand this, um, this presence of Dirac fermion is by looking at the uh, Fermi points of the band structure in the, uh, in, in the original lattice fermion, CJ. So this psi L and the psi R are exactly the low energy excitations of these two Fermi points at half filling. Uh, so in, in this low energy, uh, low energy effective field theory, uh, two direct Fermi plus and U1 dynamical gauge field, uh, this two flavor uh, corresponds to the SU2 symmetry, namely the, uh, the two spin degrees of freedom. And this U1 gauge field theory uh, corresponds to the U1 gauge structure we have seen before. Uh, one one thing to be noticed is the translation symmetry in the uh, in this Dirac theory, uh, because uh, in the field theory we have some um, continual limits, uh, which makes the lattice constant to be zero. So it means that the translation symmetry in on on the field field uh, on the spinner representation. Uh, will be behave will, will behave on site. So this psi x, uh, that this translation only will transform the um, operator to is uh, to the same operator on, at the same site when we take this um, continual limit. It means that we can gauge this translation at low energy limit, and, and we will use this fact later. Uh, now, uh, we want to uh, consider the universal invariance of this, uh, of this spin one half system. So uh, one way to do it is to look for its bulk realization. So we know that our degrees of freedom in consideration is two flavor left moving carofermion and two flavor right moving carofermion. And we know that the chirofermion can be realized on some on the edge of some integer quantum hole systems. 
So this two left moving, uh, this two left mover can be realized on the edge of the some sigma h equals two integer quantum hole, and the right mover realized by its time reversal uh, partner. So we have the some equivalent bulk description of this spin model. So why this uh, bulk is useful is that we claim that this bulk is uh, indeed a universal invariant. To see this fact, uh, we can starting from some spin models, H1, and uh, we know that any other uh, local spin model uh, differs by a local interaction H2 minus H1 from this H1. So we can add some interaction, which is exactly the difference, H2 minus H1, to transform H1 to H2. And this interaction in the bulk language uh, is just as an interaction uh, produced on the edge. Because we know that the bulk um, is a very large gap, so the correlation lens uh, almost vanishes. So this interaction doesn't affect the D bulk. And the, it, it, it means that bulk is insensible to the, any interactions uh, on, on, on its edge. So it satisfied the definition of the universal invariant. And we, we will say that this uh, integer quantum whole bulk is a universal invariant for all the spin one halves uh, models in one dimension. Uh, uh, so, it, so it gives our a way, gave us a way to classify QFTs by the conventional bulk classification of invertible uh, field series. Um, so, to uh, it, it's very easy to uh, classify the uh, bulk series uh, by its response to the external fields, because we know that at low energy, uh, the the two symmetries. Uh, of this whole system is SU2 times translation, uh, which are both on site in the continuum limit as we have seen before. So we can introduce some gauge field uh, for this for, for this global symmetry G. And uh, the bulk, uh, the classification of bulk uh, is characterized by some response partition function uh, of, this, uh, of this whole system in the presence of this background gauge field. And we, we can calculate that under some typical background gauge field, the spin one half, uh, the bulk of the spin one half is minus one, which is non trivial, which means that the bulk it attaches is non trivial. Uh, for the general spin, spin chains, uh, we, we can do the same thing as before, and uh, it's not difficult to obtain that this response partition function is in this form, and it depends on this S modular one. So there is uh, several consequences uh, of this calculation. The first one is that uh, the integer spin uh, are attached to some trivial bulk, because this, uh, for integer S, this bulk partition function uh, is trivially one. However, uh, for this half integer spin, uh, this bulk partition function. Hmm, sorry? Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so just, yeah, to, I hear. just to understand this partition function, the gauge field is dynamical. You are summing over the gauge field as well in this uh, Z that you write there? Or, uh, can you, can you yes, yes, yes. Yes, I, I can hear you very clearly. So I, I understand the question. Okay. Uh, so uh, here we use the background gauge field. So it means that, uh, of course, there is a dynamical gauge field here. So we have a U1 dynamical gauge field. Yeah. But the global symmetry is global symmetry is this spin rotation and uh, and the translation symmetry. So we introduce the background gauge field. So it, it's not dynamical. We don't sum up the uh, background gauge field co uh, configuration. But still, you are saying that the partition function does not depend on this gauge field. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry. I mean, here we choose some typical background gauge field. Ah, okay. Here is some typical background gauge field. For instance, the churn number equals to unit. Okay. So the, the the generator of this uh, churn class, I want to say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. 
Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. Thanks for 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 the question. <laughs> So yeah, so I should start from here. Uh, uh, for the half integer spin, this response partition function is minus one. So it means that all the half integer spin, uh, that their bulk are non-trivial bulk. And we know that non-trivial invertible field theories must support some ingapable boundary states. In, in other words, their boundary states cannot have a unique ground state. Uh, if we preserve the symmetries. Uh, actually, it is the famous theorem uh, obtained by Affleck uh, that half integer spin chains are incapable with a unique uh, ground state respecting this G or the spin rotation symmetry and the translation symmetry. Uh, uh, of course, this Lipschitz lipschitz mattis affleck theorem is also related with the uh, Helden conjecture. Well, let's see the second consequence. Uh, because the uh, because the QFTs of half integer spin and uh, uh, integer spins uh, have different uh, different response part uh, uh, part response partition function. Uh, so we, we can classify uh, all, all the spin models QFT into two classes based on their S modulo one uh, of the underlying spin models. So in the previous discussion on the criticality, we know that the RG flow cannot occur uh, between the CFTs within two classes. It means uh, we can classify the CFTs uh, based on the connectedness of RG flows of uh, uh, one-dimensional spin models based on their uh, S modular one. So integer spin uh, form a class, and the CFTs of half integer spin forms the, the other class. Uh, this means that half integer spin cannot share any uh, CFT with the integer spin So uh, when the symmetry is respected. So uh, this the, the, the spin models uh, don't have the same critical phenomena uh, between the half integer spin models and the integer spin model. Uh, this is so called symmetry protected criticality. Uh, this, all, all, of, uh, all of these calculations can be generalized to the uh, SUN spin models. So, in SUN spin chains at each site, uh, we have some SU and degrees of freedom, uh, which is represented by some young tablex boxes. Uh, and we found that the partition function uh, of the, the response partition function uh, for, some, uh, for some typical uh, SU and times Z background gauge field uh, is, de is determined only by this uh, B boxes per unit, uh, the total number of young tablets boxes per unit cell modular N. So it means that we have um, N classes depends on this B modular N. Similarly to the SU2 case, we have this consequence. Uh, that's the generalized lipschitz mattis theorem. Uh, for the chains uh, with B boxes not uh, divisible uh, by not divisible by n per unit cell, then its partition function is not trivial. So, it, so the bulk it attaches is not trivial, which means uh, that th these chains on the edge are getting are ingapable with the unique ground state if this SUA and the translation are preserved. And the second consequence is for the uh, symmetry protected criticality. So the spin models with uh, different B modular N cannot share the criticalities because the RG flow can only uh, occur within uh, each class, but they, they are not uh, allowed to flow between distinct classes. Uh, actually, uh, if you can see, uh, actually, actually the, the SU and CFTs are uh, uh, are represented by the weiss amino witten model. So uh, this B uh, actually is, uh, is uh, can be 
matches with the rising mean width level and some other parameters uh, uh, which characterize the translation symmetry. So, so in other words, we can put the rising mean width models into n classes. Okay, so uh, as a, th there is uh, s uh, there are several future directions. So one of the I'm most interested in is the trivial classes in two dimension. So the trivial classes means um, the the surface uh, the, the theory can be realized uh, as a surface theory on some three D bulk, and this bulk is trivial. It means that our theory on this surface is gappable with a unique ground state. Uh, ba based on the, f uh, the previous classification, there, uh, this, uh, we can do nothing further uh, in, in this trivial class. But in even, even dimensions, for instance, two dimensions, there are two more topological invariants, namely the, uh, uh, the electric quantum hole conductance and thermal quantum hole conductance. And we can, so we can refine the, this trivial class, refine the classification of this trivial class by the allowed list of the uh, integer quantum holes after these few series are gapped with a unique ground state. So uh, clearly different, um, di uh, clearly di different uh, QFTs with different uh, allowed list of integer quantum hole conductance Cannot uh, cannot flow to each other uh, by definition. I think. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the this uh, this idea has some uh, has some technical difficulty because we know that low energy field theory uh, cannot uh, uh, cannot capture the whole conductance because. The co-conductance is some, some um, the high, uh, in the band theory language, this whole conductance can be contributed by some high energy uh, spectator fermions. So let's take a look at this band structure. Imagine we have some hard feeling and uh, the, the low energy QFT uh, only care about the excitation along this gap closing point. But this spectator fermions at the high energy uh, cannot be included uh, in, into this um, low energy quantum field theory. And we know that some, uh, the spectator fermions at low energy can contribute to the barrier curvature. Uh, and the barrier curvature is, is nothing but the integer hole conductance. Uh, so uh, the, this QFT, the low energy QFT, uh, cannot uh, correctly uh, describe the whole conductance, which is a global quantity. Uh, but there is some solution uh, that the, these spectators can be captured uh, by some local regulators in the quantum field series. For instance, the, some proper choice of polyvillous regularizations. But I found that there are, some things, there are still something beyond spectator fermions. And I, I, I will show you an example uh, which gives this uh, uh, further and there further uh, difficulty uh, in, in this uh, quantum field theory description of whole conductance. Uh, the typical example uh, I found is the is the two dimensional uh, pi uh, square lattice with uniform pi flux, and uh, I require the charge conservation U one symmetry. And this uh, magnetic translation symmetry. Magnetic translation symmetry is, is some generalization of lattice symmetries uh, in the presence of some uh, magnetic flux. At half field, uh, at half field tight binding point, uh, this lattice theory uh, is uh, the dispense the structure of this lattice theory is uh, two Dirac cones. And when we uh, when we preserve this uh, this feeling factor and we symmetrically uh, gap this system with a unique ground state, then the spectator fermion argument by the polyvalent regulators 
uh, gives the wrong result that the sigma h must be even. However, uh, by a careful uh, choice of non-local regulators, so there are some regulators beyond the local regulators, uh, I found that the, the sigma h must be equal to the kappa h, which are both always uh, odd when the symmetry is preserved. So uh, uh, one remarkable thing is that uh, when these symmetries are present, these two co-conductors cannot vanish because they, they cannot be zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by uh, gap. So could you, could, you, could, you, could you be closer? What do you mean by uh, to gap your system symmetrically here? What kind of perturbation would you have? So sorry, I, can, I couldn't hear very clearly. Could you, could you repeat it? Symmetrically gap. Oh, okay. Symmetric gap means that um, uh, we gap this system with a unique symmetric ground state. But then you, you break some uh, lattice symmetries, probably. Uh, the lattice symmetry is this U1 and the translation symmetry. Right, right. Because here the translation is not the lattice translation, but the magnetic translation. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can. This this is the generalized Helder model, actually. Okay. Yeah, we can we can uh, actually the gapping term is the uh, is very strange that the nearest the nearest neighbor hopping in this in the this diagonal way and. Uh, the longer range interaction in this way. So with this kind of interactions, and the amplitude are complex. So they break the, trans the, the time reversal symmetry. So we, we can trivially gap to this system. OK. Uh, and sorry, yeah. another question. Uh, so can you say something more about uh, what's the difference between, what do you mean local versus non-local regulator? Can you say something more? Uh, uh, you're asking the non-local regulators? Yeah. What does, what, yeah. Can you say something more? What, what, is, what, what does it mean? Uh, okay, okay, yes, of course. So, uh, uh, although I don't have some slides on it, because uh, I wrongly estimated the time, uh, but the local regulators is uh, uh, means that for some certain field theory, so we have a quantum field theories. So we have uh, some, a few operators, and uh, the regulator. I, what I mean by regulator is that um, the uh, the interaction terms can be written in terms of this given uh, field operators. And the non-local operators means that we cannot written in in terms of this local field degrees of freedom. But this non-local Regulators may be some, uh, its lattice correspondence may be local. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, that's uh, for the field theory, uh, we, we, only, we only know the information around this low energy point. So the field theory contains very little information compared with uh, the lattice degrees of freedom. Uh, so there must be some operators uh, in the lattice uh, on the lattice level cannot be expressed by the local uh, field operators. So we call these operators non-local regulators. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, but s s some paper uh, but but spectator fermions. These spectator fermions. Uh, some people define some spectator fermions in in not a very good way. Uh, and they said that the spectator fermions can be captured by the local regulators, for instance, polyvalent regulations. Uh, but uh, uh, but in this example, uh, this argument is wrong, because the spectator fermions, by some symmetry arguments and yeah, and some other arguments, you combine them, then you get the wrong answers. Uh, so 
uh, but we can carefully um, study or analyze the non-local operators which can uh, happen in this in the low energy fuel series then we can find the correct answer yes. okay. is it okay yeah yeah right please continue yeah uh, so 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 i think it's a good starting point to um to understand this uh, non-local regulators uh, when we when, when we want to further refine the trivial class classification uh, <coughs> excuse me okay so here is the summary so uh, we we, uh, we somehow classified the QFTs of all SUN spin chains with the SUN spin rotation symmetry and translation symmetry and it turns out n classes and the uh, and the, the bulk um, we constructed is a universal invariance. So uh, it's a specific, specifically, it's also an RG invariant. So it can decide the connectedness of the RG flows uh, on the critical phases. And uh, it means the lattice models corresponding to these distinct classes uh, don't, share, don't share the same criticalities. Uh, and as a future direction, uh, I want to uh, I want to study uh, the trivial classes uh, in two D, uh, and uh, and I expect that there is some refinement of the uh, classification uh, by the help of the integer uh, integer quantum hole conductances. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, actually, this this is the starting point. So uh, 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 I don't have a, a, a very detailed project on this, but, but, but I mean, uh, uh, the the basic basically uh, the I, I want to study uh, at the first. Uh, as the starting point of the postdoc study is uh, this classification of the trivial classes to, to further refine uh, the to, to further refine this classification because uh, they indeed have some uh, physical observables uh, for instance the, the allowed list of integer quantum holes and it's it, it's it it gives some uh, um, some no, no go theorem on the uh, gap to face of the models. Yeah. So, uh, uh, still carrying on this slide, I have a question. So, uh, so can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, sorry, just by, uh, so I'm familiar with the fact that the whole conductance uh, is uh, related to the third number. You, you are saying that the thermal hole conductance is also related to the third number? Which number? Uh, to the chair number. Uh, 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 is it clear? Uh, can you say? Uh, yeah, 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 I can, I can, I can, this, I can hear you. Yes. I mean, uh, actually, there is two chain. Uh, th th there's a there is a electric uh, Chen Simons turn for the sigma h, and there is also a gravitational Chen Simons turn for the kappa h. So there there are there are two. Uh, I, I I don't want to say that it's called Chen number because Chen number is for the gauge configuration, but sigma h and kappa h are the lab of the Chen Simon theory. Sorry, there what? I, I missed that. What? There what? Can you repeat the last sentence? Yeah, I can hear. So, which part you lost? Oh, the just last last sentence. You are saying uh, 
All conductance and thermal conductance, they are not related to number. Yeah, yeah, chain number is chain number is for is the is some description of some external background gauge field, uh -huh. and and the the thermal hole conductance are determined by the Chen Simon's action. Okay. Yeah, you you can write down the response theory of some. Um, for instance, for the sigma h, you can introduce some background U1 gauge field and integrate it out all the matter fields. Then you can get some effective response theory. And this response theory is the Chen Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so for, for for this response here, you can you can see the level of the Chen Simon's uh, Chen Simon's term, okay. and this level is exactly the sigma h. And for the kappa h, uh, it's very uh, it's a little bit strange because you need to couple the theory to some uh, cur curved space time. So there is some Riemann curvature, and then the there you can get you can get uh, gravitational Chen Simon's after you uh, integrated out the matter fields. And the level of this gravitational transcendence is the kappa h. Okay, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Any other question? Gregoire? Um, so you, you explained this com the construction between your uh, 1D system and the bulk? Yes. Uh, no, uh, can you say something about uh, situation where your 1D system is in a one non-trivial SPC phase with the edge state. How do you see this edge state in the bulk uh, counterpart? Uh, uh, so, so sorry, could, could you repeat the second half? Um, can, can we describe the edge state of the 1D system in the yes. from the bulk point of view? Uh, y y yes, yes, yes. Uh, you mean the 1D SPD system? Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, it, the 1D SPD system can be, uh, I mean, the bulk, uh, if, if we think, if we say that the SPD phase is the bulk system, then uh, it's, it can be equivalent to the its surface system rather than its bulk system. Yeah. So just take uh, all the chain. Yeah, whole the chains. Uh, but on the finite chain, so you have two edges. Yes, yes. And uh, is there a way to understand the, the edge state in the, in the 2D bulk, from the 2D bulk point of view? Uh, it's no, this edge is zero D, right? Yes. Yes, for the I mean, uh, yeah, but, but uh, this zero edge, zero D edge can be understood in the one D bulk. Okay. But there is, uh, in my understanding, there is no higher dimension okay. uh, raising, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for uh, this and good, good night. Good evening. Yep. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.